Yeah.
Good morning, everybody. Now, it's lovely to see everybody, and there really are quite a lot of people here. Good morning to everybody at home as well. I'm sure the live stream is working well. Excellent. Um, I hope you're all nice and neatly spaced out, because we are actually definitely about capacity, aren't we, this morning, for sure. So be extra careful, everyone. Just a reminder that at the, there's no singing. And then at the end of the service, if you go straight outside and have your conversations there, it's a lovely day. And um, that will be safe for all of us, won't it? Thank you. It is great to see you, even though it's only half of your faces. We are here to worship God. We are here to give thanks to him. We're going to listen to our first song, which is Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. Psalm 95. Come, let us sing to the Lord and rejoice in the rock, our Saviour. 
let us come and give thanks in his presence and greet him with songs of praise. The Lord is a great God. He is king supreme over all. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain heights are his. The sea is his. He made it and the dry land was formed by his hands. Come, let us kneel and adore. Let us worship the Lord our maker for he is our God and we are his people. The flock he leads with his hand. Heavenly Father, we come to you today to give thanks with grateful hearts. In the midst of all that is happening in the world, we seek to see you at work and to be thankful people. But sometimes we get weary, sometimes we get afraid, sometimes we turn away from you. But we know that you will never turn anyone away. And so in your presence, in the silence, we confess our failure and frailty to you. Lord Jesus, you came to reconcile us to God and to one another. Lord Jesus, you heal the wounds of sin and division. Lord Jesus, you offer us a new beginning. God is love. Through Jesus, he forgives. So let us live in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Now, I notice we've still had more people coming in at the back there. You're not in the naughty seats. It's OK. Yeah, but thank you. Thank you for being with us today. It's good to see you. We're going to have two readings from the Bible now. The Gospel reading is this week's lectionary reading. But actually, the second reading from uh, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians is actually next week's lectionary reading. And I'll explain why I've chosen them both today. Thank you, Sue. The first reading is taken from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. A dead girl and a sick woman. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers, named Jairus, came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, 
her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, the, the, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher any more? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue read, ruler, Don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Our next reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 10. It follows from the passage of Paul recounting his vision. Verse 7. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. 
For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is God's word to us. Thanks be to him. Thank you, Sue. Yes, very powerful passages, I'm sure you agree, and I'll look at those in a minute. But first of all, uh, something I forgot to say at the beginning is, Story Keepers has started again today. Francine is in the hall with uh, with uh, five, I think it's five youngsters through there, and that's wonderful news, isn't it? Um, Hopefully you'll see them as you go out this morning if you didn't see them as you came in. But that is something to rejoice, something to be thankful for. Perhaps you've seen the link between those two passages, even though they're actually on two separate weeks of the lectionary. It's healing. That is the connection. And um, I've got seven pages. Is that okay? Now, do not panic, because I've got to get to St. John's for 11, so <laughs> we'll be all right. But I, I found that there was such a lot to say, such a lot to ponder in this. I want to look at those three people that came to Jesus for healing, Jairus for his daughter, the unnamed woman, and Paul. And in particular, I want to look at the attitude of the people, the approach that they had when coming to Jesus for healing. If we look at the Gospel reading first, what do we see about the way Jairus and the woman came to Jesus? What is the first thing that Jairus does? He comes right up to Jesus and he falls at his feet. He prostrates himself in front of Jesus. He humbles himself in front of him. How embarrassing. Would you do that? How belittling. And remember... He's doing that right in front of a crowd, everyone can see. And he's the synagogue ruler, a senior person. But Jairus did it. Why? I think it's because he was desperate. A desperate man. His daughter was dying. He'd do anything to save her. Now, what does falling at someone's feet signify? I think, in this case, certainly, it signifies that Jairus was acknowledging the power and authority of Jesus. He knew that Jesus had the power to do good things. He knew that Jesus' power was greater than his. And I think it was the same with the woman. She knew that Jesus' power was so great that she could even just touch his cloak. That power would reach out to her. So, if we want to receive healing of any form, I mean here, don't only mean physical healing, I mean spiritual, mental, all forms of healing. If we want to receive healing from Jesus, we have to kneel at his feet. We need to fall at his feet. Why do you think we kneel at the rail? It's the same thing, isn't it? It's because we're being invited to kneel before God and acknowledge his power and authority over our lives as being greater than the power and authority we have ourselves. In other words, we're letting go of our power and authority, such as it is. We fool ourselves sometimes, don't we? Uh, and we're saying, yeah, you're in charge, God. You're in charge. Now, I know we can't all kneel physically. Some of us might never get up again. But we can all kneel mentally and spiritually before the Lord in prayer. So that's the first thing we need to understand if we're coming to God for healing. We have to acknowledge his power and authority. The second thing is this. Jairus, we're clearly told, he pleaded earnestly with Jesus. And the woman, when she was found out, found she could not help but tell Jesus the whole truth, I think is the phrase used. Now that's interesting. Because don't you think God already knows what our needs are? Don't you think God already knows what we're thinking and feeling? Of course he does. Of course he does. He knows, in fact, better than we do ourselves. And I think that is perhaps partly at least why God, Jesus, asks us to plead before him 
because we need to hear ourselves saying it. And I do actually mean out loud. I think sometimes saying things out loud helps with that too. In one way, there's no need for us to tell God all about our troubles because he knows them already, but he wants us to tell him. It helps us to pour everything out. If you've ever sat with someone in trouble, then you will know that they need to talk about it. Not because they want your specific advice, but because they just need to get it out there. They need to get it off their chest. They need to hear themselves say it. They need to hear themselves articulate their trouble and what is happening to them. It's as if by doing so, they can gain some level of control over it. Or if not control, some understanding, some holding of their trouble situation. So God encourages us to share with him and indeed with others we trust. And I think God also wants us to plead our case. I don't think that he needs to be persuaded or that pleading or begging will change his mind in any way. We can't bargain with God. We can't persuade him to change his mind like that because he knows a lot more about the situation than we do in truth. And he already knows what is best for us. But he wants us to articulate our request to him because it helps us think it through and understand what we really want and what we really need rather than that immediate top level uh, demand of God. Because that process of, of pleading, speaking before God will enlighten us and enable us to see our situation more clearly. I've said this many times, but I'm saying it again this morning. Read the Psalms. If you're upset, read the Psalms, because the psalmist is often very upset too, very angry often. They start off all bloodthirsty and demanding a protection for themselves and death and destruction for their enemies, and, uh, and they do that until they've got it off their chest. And then you'll see most of them, they calm down then and get a different perspective. They get God's perspective. And then they're able to end by praising God and thanking him for being with them in the situation. The next thing I want to mention, and it's almost by way of an aside, but it's so important. Did you notice how many times the word touch was mentioned in that passage? Again and again and again. And we know how important touch is, don't we? Because we haven't had that opportunity to touch and physically comfort one another for ages now, ages. Touch is important. In the healing service at St. John's, we'd normally have people kneeling at the rail, I've already talked about that, and then I would, or Francis or whoever's leading the service, would put our hand on the shoulder of the person maybe, with permission by the way, with permission, only with permission. Touch is a very, very uh, intimate thing, you have to be very careful. But sometimes people need that touch to know that they are connected with you and with God. It's not magic. It's not magic. It is the touch and what it represents. And what it represents again is the power of God and also the compassion of God. In those healing services, it's not my power or the preacher's power and authority that's helping anybody. It's God's. It's very interesting in the gospel story, touch, because um, it has multiple meanings in this story. The woman touched Jesus. What did that mean? He was unclean. Ritually unclean, according to the Jewish laws. So her receiving that healing from Jesus through touch meant in theory that Jairus and his daughter could not get the help they needed because now he was impure, Jesus I mean. So what did Jairus do? He did nothing. He did nothing. Which in itself is a sign of uh, Jairus' desperation, isn't it? Because he would have known. But he was so desperate, he was prepared to throw away every rule and regulation 
to get Jesus to come to be with his daughter. And he had faith enough, putting it in a positive way, he had faith enough to believe that Jesus' power was much greater than the supposed impurity. And of course, he was right. Jesus is greater than all the human rules and regulations we put around who can come to church, who can be healed, and how they have to come. And he's greater than any impurity or sin or mess in our lives. Greater than all of that. Nothing can get in the way of Jesus coming to us. When we come to him desperate for healing and wholeness, he says, come, come as you are in all the mess. Just come and I will bring healing to you. The next thing is that how Jesus deals with the people. Bearing in mind they're desperate people, groveling at his feet almost. How does Jesus act in response? Does he act with arrogance? Does he act with superior power and authority? No. His overwhelming response is compassion and joy that they have come to ask him for help. Is he reluctant to help them? No. He wants to pour out his healing power upon them. He wants to give of himself to support them. So when Jesus when is asked by Jairus to go, what does Jesus do? He goes. And later when Jairus thinks it's too late, Jesus says, no, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just believe. And when the woman trembles with fear that she's been found out, what does Jesus do? He praises her for her faith and he blesses her. See, Jesus wants to respond to our need. He wants to bring healing to us. We don't have to deserve it. We don't have to bargain with God for it. We just need to come and put ourselves in front of him in humility and ask. So, by comparison, nearly, what about Paul? Loud, straight-talking, opinionated, confident in his faith. Paul, does Jesus respond to him any differently? Now, the very point of the passage that Sue read is Paul saying, I have learned humility. I have learned humility just as the other two did. He had to plead before the Lord. Three times he pleaded, didn't he? And he also had to learn that God's ways are not our ways. And he had to learn it the hard way. Three times he said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take this thorn away from me. But God does not. I think Paul's experience is like the experience of the psalmist I mentioned earlier. He starts off really angry and demanding a cure from God, pleading with God for his suffering to be taken away. But eventually, after a process of getting it off his chest and speaking it out before God, he comes through a period of discernment and he comes to the realisation that his thorn in the flesh is not going to go away. And he comes to the understanding that he's actually better that way. How amazing is that? It takes real maturity to reach that point and be at peace about it. But it didn't come overnight. It didn't just come like that. Paul had to go through the process of pleading and getting upset and then discerning. And he had to keep praying. He had to keep speaking it out loud. He had to keep talking to God about it. It was only after going through this process he was able to reach that place of peace and calm. That peace that comes from being reconciled to the situation. He grew up, he matured through the process of coming to understand his suffering. I've written a sentence here. Sometimes it is better that our pain is not taken away. That's a pretty hard sentence, isn't it? But it's God's decision, not ours. Our decision is how we deal with it and how we 
cope with it. And even with that sentence I've written, that does not mean we are not heading towards healing and we are not being healed. Paul did receive some form of healing because he learned to trust in his Saviour. He learned how to reach that place of peace. He said that he learned to delight in his hardships and weaknesses. Not because he had some weird, twisted, sadistic streak in himself, but because he'd learned the discipline of handing everything over to God's safe hands so that Christ could be glorified in his life through his weakness. But when I am weak, said Paul, I am strong. Because Christ is in me, he was meaning. Think back over the people you've known who have had to endure great suffering. Those people who have endured it with grace and have somehow managed to be at peace in the midst of all that's happening to them. Isn't it them who've shown you Christ's power of healing at work in the most? Isn't it? For when we are weak, we have the greatest opportunity to be strong in the power of Jesus Christ. When we have no resources or strength left of our own, the power and strength of the Holy Spirit of God can shine through us most strongly. Now, that's all very well for me to say, but I have never yet been in the position of having to live up to what I've just said. But I have seen plenty of people who have done so, uh, or have done their best even to do so. And it's been my honour to stand by with them and sit with them in their hour of need. I pray to God that should my time or your time come, we will be able to stand as firm as they have. Jesus says to all of us who suffer in whatever way, my grace is sufficient for you. Don't be afraid. Rest in the peace I bring to you. Free, be free from the power your suffering is seeking to have over you. Free, because my power is made perfect in your weakness. We're going to listen to another hymn now, a modern hymn, um, which talks about this dilemma, this issue. Um, indeed, its first sentence is, we cannot measure how you heal. Let's listen to that now. Oh 
Let's respond to all we've been thinking about this morning. Let us respond in prayer. Heavenly Father, we believe that you are love. We believe that you care for us intimately and individually. We believe that you know our needs. We believe that you want our healing. Father, there is so much pain and suffering in the world, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional. Things happen. People hurt us. We hurt other people. Sometimes we even hurt ourselves. Such is the human condition. And we cannot disentangle ourselves from it. Heavenly Father, save us, we pray. As we've listened to your words this morning, different situations, different people, different scales of issues have come into our mind. In the silence now, we place before you our own personal troubles and suffering, the troubles of those we know and those we love, the wider troubles and concerns of the world. We hand them to you. Loving God, if our prayers can help another person or a situation, help us to pray. If our words can help someone, help us to speak. If our silence can help heal someone, help us to be silent. If our touch, oh, that is so hard at the moment, but help us to find a way, Father God, we pray. If our coming alongside can help another person, help us to do that. And for us too, Heavenly Father, help us to come to you and to seek help from other people. So whether our thorn in the flesh is taken away or not, we may stand strong in you. For when we are we can know ourselves to be, then we can be strong in you. Heavenly Father, show us how to live as people who are weak and frail and frequently failing and yet who can stand firm and strong in you, following Jesus day by day in the power of your Spirit. Amen. There's another lovely hymn about uh, this uh, topic, and we're going to share in it now. Um, I'll do the bit in uh, light type, and if you join me for the bit in bold. 
This is to conclude our prayers. The love of God comes close, where stands an open door to let the stranger in to mingle rich and poor. The love of God is here to stay, embracing those who walk his way. The peace of God comes close to those caught in the storm, foregoing lives of ease to ease the lives forlorn. The peace of God is here to stay, embracing those who walk his way. The joy of God comes close where faith encounters fears, where heights and depths of life are found through smiles and tears. The joy of God is here to stay, embracing those who walk his way. The grace of God comes close to those whose grace is spent when hearts are tired or sore and hope is bruised and bent. The grace of God is here to stay, embracing those who walk his way. The Son of God comes close, where people praise his name, where bread and wine are blessed and shared as when he came. The Son of God is here to stay, embracing those who walk his way. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will embrace us as we seek to walk the way of Jesus today and every day. And we pray too that your blessing will go with us, the blessing of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. To conclude our service, we're going to listen to one more hymn, very traditional hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit pain we bear all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer happy trials and temptations is there trouble anywhere be discouraged take it to the Lord in prayer can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share Jesus knows our every To the Lord in prayer Are we weak and heavy laden Covered with a load of care Precious Savior still our refuge Take it to the Lord in do your friends despise, forsake you? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In His 
his arms he'll take and shield you he will find a soul is there and you will find a soul is there Oh, 